Hello, everybody, and welcome to VidCon Now. I'm your host, Amber's Wh Amber's Closet, also known as Amber Whittington. Um, and I have the pleasure in moderating a cool fireside chat with this awesome human. Welcome, Senator Cory Booker. Amber, thank you. you. You are an awesome human, and I'm grateful to be in conversation with you. So thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you about social media. I mean, it's so funny when you say being here, like we're socially distanced from each other for crying out. I think we got like right. miles and miles between us, but uh, I think in the in the time of COVID, this still feels intimate, and I'm glad to be sitting almost on your couch. Yeah, definitely. I know you're almost right here with us, but I mean, you're with us and VidCon, the young audience, you know, and so it's it's really awesome that we get to have this conversation with everyone. So, with that being said, let's jump into it. You ready? Yeah, please. All right. Cool. So today's theme is using your platform to inspire change. And so I want to talk to you about how you got your start in social media and how you use that in order to reach new audiences. So in 2009, I was blessed because a great friend of mine connected me with Ashton Kutcher to give me a final push to get on Twitter. And he appealed to uh, my mission. He just said, this is a phenomenal platform for you to reach more people. He really felt like there should be more voices who are pressing for social justice on it. He felt like you shouldn't have to rely on traditional media to translate your authentic voice, that this is a powerful way uh, to sort of uh, syndicate your own uh, um, uh, uh, material to uh, disintermediate the media, as they say. Um, so I just jumped right in and quickly found out it was everything he said and more in terms of a person that was at that time in 2009 involved in a very difficult effort to try to help an amazing city, uh, my city, achieve itself. Mm -hmm. And how do you think that's helped you reach new audiences? Well, I, it, it, it's been a, a phenomenal experience, not just in in me reaching new audiences and really supercharging my ability to help causes reach new audiences and get the word out about things. And one of my favorite early experiences was a, a uh, sort of a faux battle I had when one night I was listening to TV and Conan O'Brien The Tonight Show was on and he had a joke about Newark where he said I had done something to lower prescription drug uh, prices for some people, many people in my city and uh, he made some national news and he said, hey, I hear, here I hear Cory Booker has a, uh, I hear Newark, New Jersey has a new healthcare program. I think the best healthcare program for Newark is a bus ticket out of town. And I was like, all right, bring it, it's on. And I just realized that was old traditional media. He had millions of people that watch his show. But if we thought creatively, we could make our city and the cause of our city go viral. And I did this very formal looking video where I basically said, Conan O'Brien's insulted the city of Newark by the power vested in me by the people of the city of Newark. I ban you from Newark airport. You're on the no fly list. Try JFK, buddy. And the, and the video went so viral uh, uh, that people call City Hall complaining about me violating Conan's civil rights or uh, even the TSA felt like they had to clarify on their website that mayors uh, don't have the power to put people on no-fly lists. But it became such a big story that suddenly not only was I making news by, by millions of people paying attention to the story, but I, I was suddenly the mayor of Newark was going on the Larry King show back then and all these shows I was never invited on before because I had creatively used social media to attract traditional media into what was happening. And he eventually, um, he calls me on his uh, on The Tonight Show to apologize to me on national TV or apologize to the people of Newark and make an incredible philanthropic donation to organizations. And so it was this vindication to me that innovation, creative thinking, humor even, can spotlight issues, can highlight uh, challenges, could, uh, could, could add voice to people who, in that era, up until 2009 and 10, voices that often were kept out of media. I mean, the beautiful thing about now is the diversity of voices that are being amplified and the ability to get your cause uh, heard where otherwise people often wouldn't see uh, these issues. And we now see this bleeding into major movements where you, know, you see people uh, filming horrific events on live platforms that are being captured more and pricking the consciousness of our country. And so we are inheritors of a generation of people who used media with incredible creativity in the civil rights movement, for example. You know, uh, Dorothea Cotton, James Bevel, who helped organize uh, the stand against Bull Connor, knew that if they were creative in their activism, they could shock the conscience of a country and get people to pay attention where they weren't paying attention. 
well, we have more viral tools than they had. And I think that really comes with an obligation, and this is what my team feels, is to use the platforms that God has given us in this new era to every day try to advance the cause of our country and social justice. Absolutely. So do you think that your social media presence overall has helped you amplify your voice? Um, yes, and and amplify the voice of others. Um, you know, we, we've done things on social media platforms from, you know, trying to live on food stamps, you know, uh, that was uh, incredibly hard. I was a, abysmal failure at cooking for myself and trying to stretch the dollars and making people pay attention to the plight of, uh, of food insecurity in our country. So we, we've tried to use our these platforms that now I'm blessed to have millions of people who, who, who follow a lot of our platforms but to use them to draw attention to other voices, to other causes and other issues. So it's definitely strengthened my larger cause, which is not to be in elected office, but to achieve justice uh, in our country. And it's, it's been an invaluable tool. I can't imagine a day, frankly, where we are not trying to leverage these platforms to, to, to help our, our purpose and our mission as a team. Yeah, definitely. So I think with talking about, um, the situation with Conan O'Brien, that kind of gives um, an idea or an example of how someone could take a story and kind of flip it or um, misdirect it, right? So there's a lot of misinformation floating around social media. So how do we combat misinformation while still being able to use social media for good? Well, look, I, I, um, I'm really worried about that. A lot of, the, a lot of our platforms have become really dark and um, there's a lot of people that are almost professional trolls. You know, I, I oft, I've actually done at times confronting people. Uh, um, I, and I do it in, in what I, I, I'm just a guy that believes in radical love. So I still remember this one guy. I, often when people say something nasty to me, I just tell them I love them. And, and that's the truth. You know, I was taught in, in to, to love those who hate you. And um, I was walking through this, this office and... Uh, one of my, I often like try to take the phones from my staffers at the front office to just talk to whatever constituent might be on. And this guy was on the phone who uh, said, I don't agree with anything you stand for, but my daughter saw what you wrote back to me on social media. I just want to call and apologize basically for the language I use and for how I talk to you. And I said, God bless your daughter. And, and that's wonderful. And I want to challenge you that we don't agree on anything. And I started going through issues from the veterans issues I work on to the uh, 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 you know public school issues, because what social media often does is it heightens our differences, and and often uh, uh, deepens our dislike for each other, as opposed to trying to help us to find common ground, and and work collaboratively. And you have to be watch out for that. And there are I know this from reading intelligence reports. There are a lot of foreign agents out there. There's entire countries that have warehouses of people that every single day coming into a country like ours, trying to whip up hate, whip up division. Because when it comes to a democratic society, the more we're at each other's throats, the less productive and successful we're going to be. And so we, we know now unequivocally from, uh, uh, from American intelligence operations that there are people out there trying to spread misinformation, spread conspiracy theories, do things to erode fabrics of trust, do things to make us hate each other. And it's dangerous in the coronavirus, uh, uh, or this pandemic, for example, there were people out there trying to peddle things that could get people killed, uh, peddle misinformation that really threatened public safety. And it all gets even worse when it's amplified by a president that seems to have a, a history now, well documented, of elevating, retweeting uh, a, a lot of these very conspiracy theories or misinformation. And so we are in very dangerous times. These platforms are not inherently good or bad. Uh, uh, but the, the bad on these platforms, uh, especially when we are tempted to participate in that, um, uh, uh, it, it, it could be disastrous for us as a society. And I'm happy that our, um, that a lot of these platforms are beginning to even label Trump stuff as not true and trying to take more action against this darkness that's out there. But I think all of us have a responsibility. If we are people that want this world to be more decent 
and you do an audit of your own social media and you're not being the values that you want to see in this world, then you are part of the problem. And I think all of us should recognize the power. And there's a Stanford researcher that looked at just good deeds and kindness and how you could actually measure how it goes viral. Like it affects people multiple degrees of separation, just doing something kind, doing something nice. Well, the same thing, unfortunately, I believe happens for darkness. And so look at yourself. Am I an agent of spreading what kind of energy into this world? And I think that we all have an obligation now, especially with, with so many forces very invested in spreading darkness, that we have to be on our platforms in every way, exemplifying the best of who we are and the best of what our world really needs. Absolutely. We could do more research ourselves. We can educate ourselves more so that we make sure that we're sharing the proper things and that if we're reading something that we go and do our own research and making sure that that is correct information. I mean, you actually have more of an affirmative obligation to do those things, um, uh, to be active. And again, I challenge people all the time. Like, how much information are you researching and putting on the internet that can be helpful? You know, like, that, that where, where do you, are you, are you, is your idea of research just scrolling through your Instagram and saying, oh, okay, I'll put this in my stories, I'll put this in my stories. Or are you saying, okay, wait a minute, I'm worried about fast fashion because the very clothes that I could be wearing could be participating to environmental disasters, exploitation of workers. I'm gonna take a little bit of time and research and then tell people, because my friends, I influence them. I'm gonna say, look, I research this. Here are some brands that we should not shop at. Here are some places to go to get more sustainable things. I mean, what do you care about? What are the values that animate you and are you doing a good enough job to being an exemplar of, of the lighthouse that you should be in this world of shedding light in a lot of the, uh, the darkness? because. I really believe we all are participating in systems that sustain injustices because we're failing to question them or we're growing often too distracted by this world, mm -hmm. often too distracted by the baubles that are here, here, have us looking here, as opposed to saying, what am I about? What are my core values? And how is social media an extension of those core values and my mission in this world? Definitely. Wow. That was a lot to take in. I, thank you for that. I, I want to switch gears a little bit and I want to talk to you about the protests and the BLM movement against police brutality. So can you tell us about your bill, Justice in Policing Act, that yourself as well as Senator Kamala Harris introduced to the Senate? And how do you think that those uh, will resolve some of the issues that we face? Well, first, I, I just want to say, look, we wanted to have a bill that was just narrowly tailored to do the things that just to stop some of the bad policing practices. So we put a narrowly tailored bill. It's all about accountability. Right. Accountability is three things. It's having standards that are firm standards. You know, like we don't put people in chokeholds. We don't break into people's homes uh, in plain clothes without announcement uh, um, uh, for nonviolent drug reasons and result in like Breonna Taylor's death. So we should have certain standards. The bill puts in place a lot of standards. Next thing, it really emphasizes in this idea that we have to have transparent measures of those standards, like how many people are being uh, uh, stopped, what, uh, how many black people versus white people, where are police using force and who are they using force again? The more you open that data up to the public, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, sunshine is a great disinfectant and create accountability. And then the final thing is consequences when fail, for, for failure to meet those standards. And that means you gotta make sure that police officers, if they do wrong, can be held accountable in federal courts or federal civil courts. So that's what our bill does, but it's not enough. That is something right now to protect people, to give basics. We worked with civil rights organizations and said, what are your top things? And they put forward a whole bunch of things that could save lives, that could save black lives in particular. But we have to do so much more as a society because we are a society that says our values, but we don't live by them. And we are using police and prisons to, to, uh, uh, to deal with uh, the vulnerable in our society. So we, for the poor, we have virtually in our country, we have debtors prisons. We overly deal with mental illness in our country, not with mental health care, uh, but with prisons and jails. We deal with addiction in our community, not with access to care, but, uh, but prisons and jails. We deal with uh, uh, so many issues by this mass incarceration, retribution-like mentality that's incredibly expensive, that, that destroys human potential, 
uh, um, and causes more harm than good and disproportionately impacts black and brown people. And so we need to have a larger vision about how what real public safety is that is so much more than just police. Public safety is health care. Public safety uh, um, is economic security. There are so many things that we know are directly correlated to lower crime rates and are cheaper than police and prisons. But we have failed to be a society that makes those investments in true broad-based uh, public safety for America. Right, and providing resources to communities that need those resources to combat mass incarceration as well as police brutality and so many other things. Yeah, and, and trauma. I mean, we, we are a nation that, 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 that deals with, I mean, about 90% of the women we incarcerate are survivors of sexual trauma. Yep. And, and we, then we do things to women in prison, and they're overwhelmingly more nonviolent than men are, but then we do things to women in prison that just compound the traumas from a shackling pregnant women when they're giving birth. Uh, you know, when I was uh, sitting in, a, in Connecticut with women incarcerated, telling me about the awful realities of trying to figure out how they're going to afford to call their children when they're charged usury rates, and the women were telling me how they were making tampons because we have no menstrual equity in this country. Uh, um, and, and, and just the, 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 the harsh brutality of what we do to women who are incarcerated. We, we hurt people more when they're in our prisons, and then we release them without the supports or our help. And so we, we, this is a poverty of empathy in our country, and where people, again, we don't see each other. We don't recognize the injustices. And so much is going on in the name of us. Remember, when the system of mass incarceration, most of these criminal cases are the people versus, or the state versus. This is us. And so we are either complicit in it by doing nothing, or we are working uh, 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 to resist the injustices in the system and part of the solution. And so that's, why, that's what, what I just really believe is the urgency right now. King, in his letters to the Birmingham jail, wasn't calling out the white supremacists, the KKK. He explicitly said, this is about, this is to these, these folks who are doing nothing, good people who do nothing. As he said so eloquently, that what we have to repent for is not just the vitriolic words and violent actions of the bad people, but the appalling silence and inaction of the good people. And now I live in an era where all of us have more of a megaphone than ever before, these platforms. If you've got more than 50 people following you, you, you are a syndicator of media. And so what is your channel about? Is it about justice? Or is it about just going on with the world as it is? You get sucked into a week's worth of, uh, of posts just about trivialities or just about uh, uh, materialism. Or and, and by the way, I'm not saying that I don't post my vegan meals from time to time and get excited about something like that. I'm not saying that. But if all of us are inheritors of a struggle, you and I are sitting here, two people of color, I'm the fourth black person ever popularly elected to this institution as a senator. You're this extraordinarily uh, a successful uh, 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 a woman of color, but, but we stand on the shoulders of people that made ultimate incredible sacrifices. And so that we can't pay them back. We've got to find ways to pay, to pay it forward with our levels of sacrifice and being a, still being a part of that struggle. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why I uh, feel a sense of responsibility for my platform all the time, especially as I get older and start to um, start speaking about you know, things that are affecting our country, especially in the political realm. Um, that's, that's something that I'm very passionate about, but I've been more sensitive realizing the responsibility that I have. So getting back to the Justice and Policing Act, do you believe that that's like a, gr a great start for us? Because you're saying we do have a lot more work to do. And how do we get to the point of being able to hold these police accountable? Well, I mean, the law, and by the way, it's not just the national level. We, we need to make changes on state and local levels as well. That's why our activism has to be local, statewide, and national, and internationally, frankly, as well. So look, the, the Justice and Policing Act is important, but it's not all inclusive of the change that we need to make. It gives incredible powers to local activists through access to data on their police departments, to standards of, of, of accountability for police themselves. And, and so I think it's important to step, but we have a very long journey to go to, uh, to create true justice in policing in our country and beyond that, to create real public safety in America. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I know that you can agree with this, but I think that local elections are extremely important, especially you being a mayor prior. Um, can you explain why lo local elections are so important? 
Um, I, I can't tell people how I often tell folks they focus on the presidency and that's when we see voter participation rates go way up. Right. But the reality is, is a lot of the things that go on in your life are your state laws, who your state assembly person is or state legis- uh, senator is, who your mayor is, even who your city council and school board are. Are making profound decisions. I we get my office gets calls all the time that things are way out of our jurisdiction. We still try to help people, but often we're connecting people with state legislators or city council people or, or the like. And so that's what what this tough obligation part of the part of the cost of, of the privilege of living in the United States of America or any democracy is is being engaged enough to know that when you go into the ballot box, first of all, to go to the ballot box. Um, and, and to vote and to know a little bit about um, what's on that ballot and, and who there are. Did you know there's, when every presidential election, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that go in and vote for the president and don't continue down the ballot and vote for the other, 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 other people. And that, if, if they did, if they just said, you know what, I'm a member of X party, if they just stayed within their party lines, it would create massive change for our country. But people don't realize that state legislatures, for example, decide how your district lines are. If you want to care about gerrymandering, uh, care about them, these they decide uh, uh, so many things from our educational funding to to Medicare expansion. So many of these things are being decided on the state level. So so it's just it's just really important that people focus not just on the national elections, but on the local elections as well. Absolutely. And I want to say thank you again for being with us today. This is a, a, so amazing. I hope that the next time I see you, we can do that in, in person. But is there anything that you would love to leave the audience with? Yeah, I, you know, I, I want to I, let me just tell, tell a story because I, I so have so much respect for the people that are in part of this audience and what they do every single day. Um, they are the artists in many ways, part of the larger art community in America. And Art is essential and vital to society. It is not an add-on. It's not a luxury. And the platforms that you have, God, you have so much power. And even when we are woke, uh, as everybody that's listened to us is most likely is, we still make the mistakes of not recognizing our power and not living our values. And the simple story is, is look, I um, have a real good friend named Kevin who has been driving me most. He's a police officer. When I was mayor, he retired from the police department. But but when I'm home in New, New Jersey, he's usually driving me around. We've been in a car for decade plus, two decades almost. So we just have a connection. And and so I'm usually sitting in the backseat doing work, making phone calls. But often we can just like non-verbally communicate. He just looks in the rear view mirror. I give him the look. He knows exactly what I'm thinking. So I don't know if you've ever heard of these places. We have a lot in Newark and 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 we were driving past one. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're called McDonald's. Um, <laughs> and and uh, we were going past the McDonald's and he looks in the mirror view mirror and I look at him and I just hang my head in shame. And he knows, you know, the flesh is weak and he makes a beeline into the McDonald's three blocks from my house. And I'm a vegan. And this is back when I didn't know that McDonald's French fries are not vegan, as I found out. But I go through and all I want is just like two large fries to go home uh, on my sit on my couch, unbuckle my pants and just just like indulge in mindless TV and and fried food before I crash out for the day. So I get these McDonald's French fries and I'm I'm one of these people that's for legalization of marijuana, delisting marijuana, but I think that these fries are so addictive, we should probably schedule them as as a substance. I'm holding these things like, you know, I'm like that guy from Lord of the Rings, my precious. Um, And and then we're about to drive out, but I see a guy um, um, who's rooting through a trash can and and our eyes meet in the river mirror. He knows exactly, he stops the car, rolls down the window and I said, hey man, are you okay? And he says, uh, he sort of waves me off. And he and I have equal dignity. And I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't in any way affront his dignity. So I say, hey, man, are you all right? Is there anything you need at all? I try to say it in a lighthearted way. And he turns around and goes, well, I'm just hungry. And I, I know what I'm supposed to do. You know, I, uh, the faith that I was raised in, I, I think uh, Jesus said something about if you have two McDonald's French fries and your neighbor has none, you've got to share it. I think it was the Sermon on the McMount or something like that. <laughs> and, uh, so he comes over. I reach in the bag. I hand him these fries. And he looks happy. I feel happy. I turn my head thinking we're going to go. But he says, hey, excuse me, do you have any socks? 
And I, you know, lots of us probably worked in, 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 with, with uh, great Americans who are homeless, great people who are homeless, and know that sometimes that could be as valuable as a, as a, as a weight, in, its weight in gold. And so uh, for him to ask for it, I knew he needed it, but I looked around kind of vainly in my car, and I said, I'm sorry, sir, I don't have any socks. And I then turn around again, Kevin, it's time to go. I feel bad that I couldn't help him out with, without any socks. But Kevin doesn't go. He's not moving the car. He puts the car in park. And next thing I know, he is reaching between the steering wheel and his legs, taking off the shoes he's wearing, and he takes off his socks, and he hands them through the window to the guy. Now, here I am three blocks from my home. I have socks I haven't even opened yet, I think, in my house. This socks to that human being is worth its weight in gold. To me, my socks weren't. Why didn't I take off my damn socks? And so my point is, is that like every moment we have a chance to make a big impact in the people we pass by. And sometimes it's a small act, but for them, it's a big act. Sometimes it's just affirming somebody's dignity and looking them in the eye. Sometimes it's a building you work in, learning the name of the so-called essential worker that we haven't even affirmed their dignity and, and being able to say, hey, to them. Hello, how you doing? Thanks for the work you're doing. We have so much power, and those of us that have platforms to celebrate kindness and decency and activism, it will go viral. It will affect people. It will remind people like me, like Kevin did, that in life, I should take off my damn socks. And so I just want to say thanks to everybody out there that's inspiring this country to, to, to expand their moral imagination to go a step further, to open themselves a little bit, to risk a little bit, to put their heart out there. I'm a big believer that if America hasn't broken your heart, you don't love her enough. Because when you love something, you put your heart at risk, you put it out. Absolutely. And so I just want to thank you all for living that way. I want to thank you. This is a great, this is not our last conversation. I hope not. I hope not too. Come on, get, get, stay in touch. You are no. you're a remarkable person. Thank you. So are you. You're so inspiring. I can't even tell you how much you've done for shifting my my direction and my journey as well. And I, I thank you for that story, too. That really touched home for me. And um, I know inspired so many people out there. Well, I'm embarrassed. I wasn't following you on Instagram. I am now. <laughs> wow. I feel wow. I'm honored. So and I'm going to I'm going yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look through and find my favorite post and send it to Rosario. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. This, this is a fan of yours. <laughs> too much. It's too much. Oh, my God. Well, everybody, make sure you are following Senator Cory Booker on Instagram and um, and Twitter. I also follow you on Twitter, and you're, you're killing it on there as well. And thank you to the VidCon audience. Make sure, remember, if you want to continue this conversation, make sure to check out VidCon Now Discord under Using Digital Platforms to Inspire Change, and you can keep the conversation going. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye.